Order, order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Energy, Security and Net Zero Committee, probably the hardest working committee in Parliament, given this is our second session uh, today. Not that we like to blow our own trumpets, but this, <laughs> this is the first on the domestic supply chains for low carbon technologies. And today we have two panels or three, each lasting about an hour, so those who have started to watch now, um, will, uh, we can probably tweet on Energy Committee if they want, hashtag uh, anybody watch it. But um, we have two committees, uh, two panels, sorry, and the first panel's in front of me now, and as ever, name, rank and serial number, starting from my left. I'm Richard Arnold, Policy Director of the Marine Energy Council. We represent the UK's tidal stream and wave energy industries. Excellent, thank you. I'm uh, Jez Haskins, I'm the Business Development Director for Taylor Woodrow, and we're a uh, business delivering UK infrastructure. Taylor Woodrow, very famous with the tug of war logo. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And finally, and I'm Nicholas Petrat. I'm the CEO for Brush Group. Um, we offer a variety of product services and engineering solutions to the electricity distribution. Thank you all very much uh, for coming uh, along this afternoon. Um, basically, what would be your top concern about the current state? Oh, I am indeed. I've been reminded by my clerk. There's been a bit of a change to the schedule programme so we can allow the even busier uh, Mr Barry Gardner to go elsewhere to his other committee. Oh, Not only does he do two with one committee, he's going for a third with another second committee. Mr Gardner. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And, and can I apologise to our witnesses in advance that I will be leaving straight after to get to the other select committee. Um, I, I want to explore the, the supply chain bottlenecks that exist, the constraints in supply chain to get us into the uh, low carbon future that we want. Um, and really, it's to look at what elements of the domestic supply chain you think need most development. Um, Estrano, do you want to, to start off? Yeah, sure. So I think the biggest issue for us is ensuring there's or ma maintaining a route to market. So the UK government set a ring fence for Tidal Stream, which was very welcome. That has seen a significant step change in the deployment pipeline for Tidal Stream. And that will give the U UK supply chain confidence to invest, to shift manufacturing, to actually uh, address and accommodate these significant changes. I think more broadly, there are sort of foreseeable issues to do with uh, cabling. Um, we, well, some of my members talk to me about there being 18 month delays and, and wait times to get uh, cables for their uh, projects but for us as a sector at the moment that's not the most pressing issue I'd say. Thank you Mr Haskins. Yeah I mean for us it's it's all about the capability and capacity within our supply chains and how we can expand that, that capability and capacity so CITB for example says that, you know we need a growth of 225,000 extra people within the construction industry by 2027 which is a considerable growth so so for us it's all about the question of how do we grow how do we grow that because what, are, what are you doing as Taylor Woodrow to actually you know what what apprentice scheme ship yeah. schemes have you put in place how, how are you actually developing that yourselves as a company and as an industry I'll give you an example so an energy related example at the moment so we're on a framework for National Grid to upgrade the transmission network. Um, we, we, for us, it was new to get onto that framework. We were partnered with another part, a, a sister company of, of, of Taylor Woodrow's, a company called um, Amexon. And as part of that, we set up a training school up in the northeast in, in, in Castleford. And the business has opened up 13 of those around the world. This is the first one we've done in the UK. And that was, that was primarily because we had confidence in, in that this work was going to happen, so we could invest in that. So sort of a year out, and that'll, that'll put 100 apprentices a year through that training school, and we'll put about 400 plus through doing reskilling. So I think that'll be my key message, where we have confidence that the work is, is, is gonna happen, the projects are gonna happen, the investment's there, there's a clear pipeline clear commitment, we can start to invest to, to grow our people and, and, and to grow that capability and skills. Very interesting. I mean, one of the, the themes of certainly the written evidence that we've received is precisely that that confidence that you can see the, the full extent of the yeah. supply chain. Um, just to uh, 
Siemens actually uh, said to us that most supply chain, they said the main issue highlighted was the government's project by project approach mm -hmm. and the absence of a clear pipeline. Most supply chain investments take more than one project to pay back. A series of one-off projects is not a pipeline mm -hmm. unless you can see the series in advance. Um, so it, it, you would echo those sentiments? Completely. Completely. Yeah. And, a, and a pipeline can't just be a list of projects as well. Yeah. It has to be a robust plan, the secrets they're going to come to market. People need to believe that the dates when these things are going to be procured, when they're going to be going on site, they're, they're believable. And when it's robust, you know, we can see a pipeline out for several years. That's exactly as you say, when you're prepared to make an investment. I mean, that, that, that training school cost us £400,000 and we invested that before any work was secured. Yeah. So. You know the, the work is now coming on board, and it's been it's a good investment okay. for us. But now, Mr. Petrat, the, the last time I had an interaction with Brush, I think I was outside complaining about your fire and rehire policy. Um, but we're in different territory today, so we're we're friends in this occasion, although we weren't on that. Um, so tell tell me your take on this. I mean, I fully agree with, uh, with what has just been said, and I, I can just share our personal experience from a business. Um, 15, 18 months ago, we were starting to work on how do we increase capacity in our transformer facility? How do we start recruiting more people? We've reopened um, our um, winding shop, uh, which had been closed for 15 years, so we're retraining people, reinvesting. And the assumption we're working on at the time was a market growth of 20, 30 percent, which is quite big um, for us. What we've seen in 2023 is probably 400 percent market growth. And no one, and certainly not us, is ready to deliver that growth. So it's, it's a very nice problem to have because it means we can recruit more, we can invest more in the business. But at the end of the day, I have regularly to stand in front of customers and tell them that we are not yet at a stage where we can support their projects. And, and having that visibility, having the the heads up of what is going to come our way, what is going to happen, is going to be absolutely fundamental. And I also want to come back to the point um, that was made earlier about training and, and the availability of people. Everything we do is um, engineered for a, and designed for a specific project. We don't manufacture anything off the shelf. Um, and therefore, the amount of engineering hours and the amount of engineering resources that we require is quite significant. We really, really struggle today to get the right number of engineers going through um, the business. Um, we are struggling with recruitment on the engineering. Why are the national sector specific targets and CFD allocations not enough to promote natural supply chain growth? I think, I mean, from our standpoint, CFD is not really um, impacting us because we only touch the, the power distribution, so we're really not in the, uh, on the generation side anymore. The, what Brush does essentially is build um, connection points to the grid, so it helps, and I have more and more, obviously, customers on the renewable side and on the battery storage, for example, but their, their challenge is, very simply, they can't get a connection quick enough. And this is where there's a lot of investment on the power generation, but it's how do you put that generation online on the grid, which is the, uh, the challenge. And our industry is not, um, probably not sexy enough. Uh, we do really struggle to get young people to get attracted. What should government be doing to help you? The key for me is um, as much um, publicity as possible around all the perspectives in the industry. It is a really exciting industry. We are actually helping deliver net zero. That is a really big thing for us and, and all our employees are very keen on that. But somehow that doesn't seem to transpire enough. Um, and on the long term, we just need to incentivize more people to get into engineering degrees. Haskins, you're nodding. Yeah, I, the, the one, I think if I had one ask, one thing we could really do is to put some put some uh, ownership accountability, some leadership in there and have, I would suggest, a construction infrastructure minister. There is a construction minister and we have social infrastructure in hospitals, schools, housing, potholes, they're all vital, they're all very, very important to keep productivity in Britain, growth in Britain. But what we really need is an infrastructure minister, I think, you know, to focus on the nationally significant infrastructure projects, for example. Because, you know, when I look through the documentation, you know, if you looked at um, the net zero strategy, you know, Build Back Greener, 
it's, it's a very, very good strategy and there's some really good policies below it, but what it needs is someone to be constantly putting that message out there and saying we're committed, you know, I'm accountable for this, I'm going to drive this through. Because I, I do think there's a lot of very, very good initiatives out there. What it lacks is someone who's really saying they're owning it. I just I think, think a, 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 an infrastructure constriction minister could take that ownership on. Thank you very much. And once again, my apologies. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr Gardner, uh, whose efficiency demands he has to leave instantly. <laughs> thank you. Um, gentlemen, um, really, the, as, as Mr Gardner mentioned, the, sort of the, the, the Siemens evidence which I gave the committee, which I'll, I'll come back to, but just a general question, your top concern about the current state of the, the domestic supply chains in the UK for emerging low carbon technologies. Uh, I mean, Siemens have mentioned pipeline, they've mentioned CFD has not always been appropriate uh, for new stuff, they've, they've talked about the support for going existing industries, they've talked about, I think this was maybe one of the most interesting bits of the evidence, of the size of investment they were prepared to make in Hull uh, in 2014, um, but it was it was made smaller when, from the first announcement in 2010 due to government sort of announcement and a seeming government uh, flakiness uh, on, um, on on support because government I, I often contend talks about market forces but it is the biggest force in the market itself and it doesn't fully always recognise that. But your own concerns, what what are you, what are you thinking? I'm going to come back to, to the point of, of visibility. Um, and if, if I'm to release it, we just released a big investment in our transformer facility in Loughborough. I don't expect um, government support for this. The, the market forces should be sufficient. There is a lot um, going there. Will the, that be the same in all countries? Would you, would you expect that? I mean, is it, are some countries providing a better environment for you than you get in the UK? Or would you want all countries to be like the UK? So I, I, can, I can talk about the UK mostly because what we've done with, with Brush is we're 95% focused on the UK now. We see the UK market as being absolutely brilliant for us. There's a huge amount of work that can be done. Um, and we're actually not actively pursuing outside opportunities. We've got few and far between customers that we still serve outside, but we want to deliver for the UK and we're in the UK and we want to serve the UK. But the key thing for us is again that visibility. If I have a clear pipeline of two, three, four years worth of project, it becomes quite easy to um, release the funds and get the financing and, and look at the return for a, for a major investment. When we're looking at a project by project, um, it's very, very difficult. And again, looking at a very practical experience from the Brush Group, I'm gonna take our transformer facility four years ago we, we had barely 10 million of revenue of worth of product to deliver. Last year, this was 35 million. There was no time whatsoever for us to really gear up, and the market has jumped. Um, and that is the challenge. Having that visibility, it makes it very straightforward. I mean, just ask it, to turn to you to grow the domestic supply chain. Should the government support me focus on existing businesses and new businesses? Sorry, could you repeat that? Should, should the government support to grow domestic supply chains? Should they be looking to support new businesses or existing businesses? Should they nurture what they have or should they hope for something else to, to grow? I think, I think, I think nurturing what, what they have because I think that lot, most of those businesses have the skills, if I look at what we do, to actually be able to do that growth quite you know, relatively easy and get it started. Whereas a new business, yes, they, they're going to go through that longer learning curve, Whereas I think our business, we already have established ways of, tr of training our people, bringing on, on people, and we can increase that. So I think, I think it's a combination of both. It should be encouraging both. But I think the, the existing supply chain they've got, there is, there is definite capacity there for us to be able to expand. So that, that's what they, they should be focusing. Thank you. Richard Arnold, are there sectors where the UK is particularly successful in developing supply chains, do you feel, uh, and there any that could be nurtured better than have been? Or have potential. I mean, I'm always asking you to pick winners, which is difficult. But yeah, so uh, well, the LSE's Grantham Institute did a really good study last summer, looking at where the UK had uh, advantages in comparison to other countries, and in which renewables. And you won't be surprised to hear, because I raised it from the Marine Energy Council, that tidal stream comes out really far uh, in front of other technologies. And I think what the UK can do is learn lessons from 
renewable development elsewhere. So Denmark, for example, has developed a really strong wind industry. Mm -hmm. It's worth around £7 billion a year in exports alone to its economy. It's worth more, to, it's worth more than the UK defence sector, apparently, which we often hear. And that's an absolute number, I understand. Exactly, and that's despite the UK having a much better resource. Uh, and the reason why Denmark managed to steal the sort of initiative from uh, the UK was because they had a feed-in tariff, they had a uh, competitive tax regime to invest in its supply chain, uh, and now they're reaping the benefits of that. And to go back to the point around the contracts of difference mechanism, which has been incredibly successful at increasing renewable deployment, but the mechanism is designed to lower LCOE, uh, levelised cost of energy, um, not necessarily sort of to build UK supply chains yeah, to create yeah. green jobs. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a conflict within the government's approach to that. So they talking about introducing now the sustainable industry reward, uh, and that would benefit different projects, particularly if they could prove they're investing and having a certain amount of local content. That, uh, that's an interesting distinction. What do you call the levelised cost of energy? Levelised cost of energy, yeah. That's okay. what those sort of projects bid into CFD are based or judged upon. Thank you. My six minutes are up, and for the next six minutes we've got Vicky Ford. Vicky. So Jess, how independent are the supply chains for different emerging technologies? How independent or, yeah. or interdependent? Interdependent. Interdependent. Um, there certainly is, I mean, there is a degree of uh, interdependency between them. If I look, I mean, in the top type of work we do, um, you know, building infrastructure projects, there is a very close link between all of our suppliers and, you know, there's a follow-on, there's always a follow-on, there's always a design interface. Between, between different suppliers. So, yeah, there is a very big um, interdependency so, so between them. So, yeah, success of one of our suppliers um, is, is very dependent on the performance of, of another supplier. And you know, if I look at one of some of our big contracts, we could have over 100 different subcontract suppliers into a, into a project. And, yeah, the interfaces, interdependencies between them um, is when very When you're important. looking at a particular part of the renewables, you know, let's say your supply chain for solar versus your supply chain for a wind project, mm -hmm. are, are they similar types of contractors needed? Are they, um, or, they are, are they? yeah. I mean, in the work we're doing, because we're doing the installation, so we would do all the civils infrastructure and then do all the installation and all the commissioning. Yes, there's going to be subtle differences between whether you're putting in a solar park, obviously, to putting in a battery storage or, or, or some other facility there. But, it, but in terms of the supply chains we're often calling upon, it is the, the, the mechanical, the electrical partners, those who are experiencing mm -hmm. you know, the transmission networks, whether it be transmission or distribution networks. So you know, there is that we often are using similar, similar partners. Yes. And, and Nicholas, when you look up standards for the same product, like steel or cables, are they the same standards that we use in the UK or in other countries, are they different? From a strict um, standard standpoint, there, there are some differences, but they're not very, very significant. Um, we, as an industry, have a tendency of creating differences where we don't necessarily have to. And we're great um, at doing that. We're, sadly, we're very, very good. So as, as, a, as an equipment manufacturer, this is usually the, the misery of our lives, where two projects are always going to be totally different, um, when we could actually simplify a lot. But I do want to echo what, um, what Mr. Haskins was saying in terms of the, the interdependence of the, uh, the supply chain. And if I look at, to be simplistically, you're going to have your generation side. So it can be solar, it can be um, mm. wind. There will be specificities in each of these. You then have the bottleneck of the connection in the middle, whether it's a transmission mm. um, project or a distribution project. And this is where usually we end up with a big challenge because there are not enough players in the market or they haven't got capacity left. Not enough players able to connect. Correct. Not enough capacity of the players. And is that skilled people or access to cables? No, this is skilled people. It's all about um, people. Again, the vast majority of what we do, um, if I look at a 18 month um, lead time for a transformer, we probably have less than a month of actual manufacturing. It's all about what happens up front. And um, do manufacturers really have a clear grasp on the volumes that they need? No. No, I would agree with that. No, that's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, 18 months lead times on some of these, I mean, you know, we mentioned the CFDs, they're great for giving that confidence that the project's getting committed to, but at that point, it's not when you're actually placing an order with, 
you know, Nicholas's businesses, you know, that can come very, very late. And often if the, the way the contracts are done now, that, that, that you won't be purchasing the equipment till the main contract's placed, the clock starts ticking, you know, 18 months ahead is when that's going to turn up. If you can place the contracts earlier, you could be bringing those, that equipment and in much sooner. And when you're sooner. looking at supply chain issues, I mean, we had a major issue across the world following the pandemic about chips, right? Yep. Um, and lots of discussions about, you know, the rare earths, you know, the most difficult bit that you need to go into a product. Is it that issue that the fight for the most difficult bit, that very rare commodity, is that what the problem is? Or is it something much more generic like we don't have enough steel? It is much more generic and it's not about the, the is it commodity. Both? Well, there are some areas where it's very, very specific, but I'm going to make it a lot more generic. And to me, it's not about steel or copper or the availability of most of the raw material. It's the ability to transform these raw materials into what is required um, to manufacture the products. Um, we can buy copper from anywhere, not that we would, but there's a lot of copper available. But the number of players who can transform these copper into a transformer winding is very... a lot of copper available, but and we're getting lithium from Cornwall, hopefully. Derek here? No, he's not here. Um, but are there other Use much rarer things that we haven't narrowed down enough? I get, I get you that it's the transforming and the manufacturing capacity. One minute. But, okay, but... Is there another thing we need to be worried about? In my experience, and again, on the connection on the distribution sites, it's not about the raw materials, it's about the transformation. Okay. Any comments from you, Jess? I was just going to agree with that. I would, I would think that if you would just look at one particular example, it's going to be cabling. We need so much cabling. You look at the HVDC programme in this country, the thousands of kilometres, and that's where the pinch point's really, really going to come. There's going to be others in there, but if you said a critical path item, which is really going to delay us, it's going to be big, big, big items like cabling. Thank you. I you want to come I'm to pick up a point that Mr. Perrot said. Uh, you said about the challenge of two projects being totally different. And I want to ask you about what we need to do to get to standardisation. So, for example, we understand that Hinkley Point is being developed as a, a new nuclear power station, and the, uh, lots of learning taking place in that. And it, when we come on to do size will, size will will be less expensive because there will be learnings from the first one, and presumably some form of standardisation. So. What can the industry, what can government do to improve standardisation so that you don't get the costs incurred by the, the next project being completely different from the one you've just done? And, and I think that's a really, really interesting question. The, the key to me is probably a bit more uh, specific on some of the, uh, some of the regulations, some of the, um, the policies being issued. Um, we work quite extensively with all the DNOs, um, so the distribution network operators. They all have their regions. Um, we all work to the they same... They all have different standards. They all have their specificities. Um, and a design that we will do for one DNO is not going to be the same that we have to deliver for another DNO. What would... I'm going to ask you for a figure now. How, how much could we reduce the cost of this investment if there were to be a standard on a standard for the kind of equipment that you provide? I think it, more than the cost, we could significantly reduce the lead time. Right. Um, I will give you a very practical example. It, take, if you can, yeah. it takes a year to do a standard transformer. I recently agreed with a customer a six-month delivery because they agreed to take a, an existing design. Right. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Mark, go on in. Uh, Nicholas, I'm going to sort of carry on uh, with, with, with your comment a little bit earlier, which is about the... Uh, that it's not about the raw materials, it's all about the, the, you know, how, the, the actual kit. And I, I think in your evidence you gave a comment where your competitors commonly import 33 kilovolt units from Colombia, Turkey or India, and you're, you're, not, you're unable to compete with their prices. Um, do you want to expand on that? Because, because, because at the end of the day, you know, ideally we can produce this stuff locally at a competitive price, and that does need raw materials. There's raw material, but... If I look at um, a transformer, which this example is based on, it's around 75% um, material and 25% labour. So the labour is, is an important part. There's obviously a lot of transformation, of um, transportation. Yes. Um, the other element, and back, back to my point um, earlier about the transformation, what creates our bottleneck today 
is the ability to wind the core of the transformer to so the bobbin at the at the heart of the transformer. Mm. Um, we had to acquire one of our uh, suppliers last year to secure our own supply chain because otherwise <coughs> we're being priced out of out of market. Now the reality, and that's all pieces of kit that have been been assembled. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, um, we also have a, a cost issue. Um, I want to keep investing in training, recruitment. Uh, we just released, um, for us, a relatively big investment in, in a brand new test cell in the UK. So all that requires some cost. Um, and yes, we are more expensive. And the feedback I get from my customers typically is, we keep buying brush because we like the quality, but you're more expensive than, than everyone else. On the, on, on the, <coughs> the labor point, so, so I kind of get why labor can be expensive if you're manufacturing something like chain, but you're, but you're talking about some pretty sophisticated bits of, I mean, it's not that sophisticated, but, but sort of transformers, but, but, but ultimately, you know, the modern factories are now staffed with robots, and you can have one or two people there, or is that not the case with? Shaking your head there, okay. <laughs> so we actually have a very highly skilled workforce. Um, everything we do is not um, automated. We have no robotics in our factory, and it's all about the skill sets of our employees. And it typically takes nine to 12 months as a minimum to train our workforce on the shop floor. They are highly skilled roles. Uh, it's going to sort of perhaps talk about sort of the wider raw materials sort of supply chain and just, just kind of looking at some of this stuff. You've got the um, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo supplies seventy percent of cobalt, China sixty percent of rare earth elements, India Indonesia forty percent of nickel, Australia fifty five percent of lithium mining and Chile for twenty five percent of that. Um, Vicky made a very good point before she had to go. Um, was that was we're, we're now getting uh, lithium out of Cornwall? But I, from what I understand, is that lithium they proudly announced that they could provide enough lithium for the batteries for 35,000 domestically produced cars every year. The UK at peak production is 1.7 million cars. Um, all of those are going to have to be electric cars by 2035, um, some would argue by 2030. There's no way we're going to be able to pr produce enough raw materials in order to have gigafactories producing this type of stuff. What do you think? Yeah, I tend to agree with you. When, when, when the numbers, you look at the numbers, yes, we can do, we can make a, quite a significant step change in our production, but to get to the levels you've just spoken about there, yeah, it is, it is going to be, um, it is going to be difficult. I mean, in our, in, in the sphere we operate in, a lot of the basic materials we would use, the steel and the concrete, I think they can be increased to meet the, the levels of, of construction. But as we said, the pinch points are really going to come in, in the sort of work with the, the areas of supply which, which Nicholas is, is talking about there, which do take longer to produce the skilled mm -hmm. people in, involved. I mean, for us, the, the, again, coming back to the pinch point for us, it, as, the, as the quantity of what we're installing in, say, in the transmission networks, it's about having those trained uh, uh, line installation engineers, those people who have skills which take a long time, years to, to develop. That's not something you can train them in straight away. And that's why we're trying to invest now, because it's the only way we're going to be able, able to ramp up to it. But, but you're right, if we follow the trajectory, you would need so many, so many people with so much materials. It's, it, it, it's going to be you know, a tough ask to get there, but I know that we can definitely ramp up, you know, we can ramp up a great deal from where we are now. What, what, at the back of my mind, so, so, so this, the, this idea of high-skilled British jobs is, is absolutely fantastic, and for, for any government, it's just exactly what we want to we want to hear, and, and we want to do everything we can to support you for that. But I still worry about, you know, over the last five years or so, we've seen we've seen supply chain problems that have been created by a war in Ukraine, by COVID, but we've seen a supply chain problem provided by a bloke who couldn't sail his ship down the Suez Canal. And it's it's the trouble is it, you know kind of the world is a very difficult place to operate in. It's too narrow. And we're, I'll take you there. It's quite a new thing. But he but he was a worse pilot than you imagine. But it was um but but it, but it's an important point. I mean I mean you know if you're if you're if you have expensive well trained workers in the UK who need either parts and components or raw materials, actually we're in a vulnerable position. And what I'm really I suppose getting to is, do you think the government has is doing the right policies to make sure that we can secure our supply chains, that we can encourage them, and that we're competitive on a global basis. Who'd like to go first? Go on, one of you must be the um, Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's just back to the sort of transmission market I was talking about. Yeah, I think I think the policies, they are there. And um, 
I guess I, what, what I was looking at earlier, if you looked at what came out of the recommendations of the Windsor Review and then the following on from that, the Transmission Acceleration Action Plan, that, that's a really, really, they're, they're, you know, the Windsor Review was very good and the action plan which has been put in place is very good and I think that, that would move things along. The important thing now is, and I guess it's coming back to a point I was making earlier, is that action plan, and what's set out in the annex of that plan, is, is delivered because there's some, some, some hard uh, actions to be, to be delivered at the start of this year and making sure those, those are happening is, what, is what's going to help. You know, you whether it be supply chain, whether it be, be more people, more capability, capacity delivering on those commitments is what would really help. I think if I can, if I can add a, a very practical example, and I do want to come back to what's close to my heart about engineering. So I'll go back to the chips that were discussed before. Um, and one of the very difficult times of, in my tenure was having to buy two years worth of chips of Amazon, because that's, that was the only vendor we could find Amazon. of Amazon um, a few years back when we had these challenges. Yeah. Um, and we, we did manage to secure two years' worth of stock at a very high price. Um, fast forward two years, our engineers find a way around this, and we no longer needed these chips. And to me, we can always... They're obsolete. Correct. Well, are they obsolete, or can you... I mean, presumably they have a, a we, commodity value. Well, we, we used them, yeah. but we moved to a design which didn't require these chips that we can no longer find. So my, my concern with the focus on the product and the supply chain is we're always going to be... A step back because we're going to focus on what is becoming the problem today but by reinvesting in that long term that design capability that engineering capability we can actually solve the problems that we've not identified yet because there's in from my experience again in terms of a brush in the majority of the cases when we have a, a bottleneck on the specific product we actually manage to design around it and avoid that and replace the material with something else it clearly not going to work in every industry but in a number of cases, it does work, and that is the agility that we need from my standpoint. Very helpful, thank you. Quickly, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, that was great what you just said there about uh, bypassing the, the chip. But the automotive industry uh, was relying on chips during uh, COVID, and uh, it, you know, the industry was devastated, uh, you know, we're waiting to get the supply. Now, what worries me is uh, if you've got a situation where a lot of countries now are ramping up, uh, you know, to get down to uh, net zero. So on a lot of materials, uh, they're, they're all, particularly what you were saying before about cables, uh, etc. So are we ready, uh, for example, uh, you know, with these, or are we, are we going to have the same situation? Because if, if every country's after the same raw materials, well, that, that, that means there's going to be an increase in them commodities. So, you know, it's, uh, we, can't, we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to do something about it. You know, so when you were saying before, about uh, it may not necessarily be the case that we get these uh, uh, materials in, but I, I think we should be making provision because uh, it's going to be like a, like a Dutch auction uh, where people say, you know, and this happened during COVID uh, with the in the pharmaceutical industry where, where, where people were buying, you know, when the air, when the aircraft was on the uh, you know on the runway, so but a, a demand and supply sort of situation. Yeah, yeah. So that so what's your what's your, your view on that? Do you think? There's, you know, we've got to learn. We've got to learn our lessons from the past, haven't we? In terms of uh, you know supply chains, are they too far away, uh, or they should be near a, uh, near a home? You know. I I mean, uh, my apologies if I wasn't uh, if I wasn't clear. I'm, I'm certainly not arguing not to do anything. Um, to me, it's there's a there's a long term action, which is how do we de-risk on the products that we've not identified yet as a risk. Um, I think on the short term, yes. We know what we know today, and you're absolutely right, there will be a huge push. And it's not just about commodities, though. We've got to be very clear on this. Again, I was with one of my customers two weeks ago, and the message I got was, I need more capacity from you because my European supplier have just told us that their capacity has been allocated to someone else, not the UK. So it's not just the components, it's the assembly capacity, and we do need to be ready to ramp up very quickly internally if we want to secure our own supply chains. Can I just put I, I go back to uh, Mick Whitley, so we supplementary as well. I mean, I'm also on the Joint Committee for the National Security Strategy, and on Monday we had quite an interesting uh, session. It was about economic security, and energy featured hugely in that, as did the materials that were required, and giving evidence was um, Ed Conway uh, of Sky, I think, but he was mentioning that 
six commodities of sand, salt, iron, copper, oil, and lithium. And two fascinating things came forward. With, for instance, there's one quarry in the United States that provides a bit of quartz that goes in all chips in the world. So this is required everywhere. Uh, and of the copper that's been mined since the beginning of the Bronze Age, about the same amount of copper has to be mined again in the next 22 years. So we're talking about 5,000 years. So we're almost on a, on a pivot point. I thought it was 30, but he said it was 22. Um, those sort of two little facts, especially the copper fact, how aware do you think people are in general energy industry? It's all right to be looking at Mick saying that this demand is chasing the supply, but how aware are people of the pinch point? Richard, I can see you drawing breath as if you're ready to give that <laughs> an answer, but what are yeah. your thoughts? Well, I think for, and to slightly link, link it into Mick's point there around um, countries competing against each other, it's also technologies within a country competing against each other. So okay. the things like port infrastructure, ensuring that there's significant capacity to deal with uh, a range of different technologies, deploying projects uh, off, you know, in, in our seas. Um, for us, as an emerging sector, uh, one of the benefits we have is that we can learn some of the lessons from wind and embedding circularity uh, and thinking about sort of the life cycle of the different projects. So there are plans already to sort of reuse materials. Um, and a risk, I suppose, for us is that we don't have the same buying power that the offshore wind industry has. So if the offshore in wind industry is demanding more of the rare, rare earth materials, <coughs> it's unlikely that those are going to get, get pushed towards ourselves. And that's why having sort of a strategy for marine energy deployment in the UK is really uh, critical. Thank you. I think one thing I've certainly learned this week is how, again, how, how much I don't know, and on Amazon I'll be downloading a material world, a substantial story of our past and future by Ed Conway on those materials I mentioned, and maybe the next time I'll know a bit more about copper, lithium and the rest of them. But in the meantime, I'm passing the baton back to Mr Whitley, uh, who I think is poised and ready to go. Yep, uh, my my uh, question is to uh, Richard Fairs, and what different, uh, differing roles do public and private investment play in growing domestic supply chains? <laughs> I think the really key thing is for um, public financing to provide the confidence to leverage in private investment. So, for example, the, the ring fence uh, for tidal stream in consecutive auctions has led <coughs> us to have just 10 megawatts of tidal stream deployed. We now have a pipeline to get 100 megawatts by 2028. Uh, and that is a massive increase in the amount of turbines that are going in our waters. It means that uh, manufacturing facilities are moving from the Netherlands to the UK. Um, but one of the issues with the CFD is that its budget is announced on an annual basis. So next month, March 13th, we'll find out whether we have a ring fence for this year's renewable auction, but we don't know whether we have one for next year, the year after that, and so on and so forth. And so as we scale up, having that sight uh, and having that sort of commitment by the government is absolutely crucial. So that's why we advocate for a one gigawatt tidal stream target by 2035 and a 300 megawatt target for, for wave energy. Does the government's views on winners align with uh, private finance? I think it's a, it's a choice. So I mentioned earlier around levelised cost of energy. The government clearly wants the CFD to do more than just get the lowest cost renewables onto our energy system. And that's absolutely right, because the lowest cost energy system in, by 2050, isn't the, the pathway to that isn't just through the lowest LCOE today and tomorrow and, and next week. Uh, they have to be thinking about the energy mix that they want. And so by deploying just six gigawatts of tidal and six gigawatts of wave, you'll save one billion pounds per annum in energy system costs. Um, so it's of having that foresight and having a strategy and a plan for, for realizing its marine potential. You know, we, we know like, a, you know, we don't put all our, all our eggs in one basket. So we're talking about solar power, wind power, wave power, tidal power. But if the government's, uh, you know, like a, Looking back at the Swansea Lagoon, uh, when the government withdrew, uh, you know, we've been involved in, in, in the Liverpool uh, Farad system. And uh, if the government's, you know, were, uh, uh, like a reluctance uh, to put that money in, that scares uh, private finances off, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I didn't represent uh, tidal lagoons or tidal range, just uh, tidal streams. So that's sort of the speed yeah, yeah. of the tides rather than <coughs> range. But absolutely, the, the, the logic applies, of course, yeah. And the same question to the colleagues. I mean, going to your, yeah, to the to the private funding, public funding, they're both absolutely critical. I mean, I think everybody knows that, that, that private funding likes infrastructure. They give good good returns over a long period. Once the CFDs are in place, the guarantees are in place, 
then, then they're, they're good. But the public sector financing, the Infrastructure Bank, for example, that seed funding, that upfront funding to get the, to get the designs done, to get the DCO, the planning application process of the DCO, et cetera, is absolutely, you know, again, fundamental. I mean, the investments they're just making in the ports, the colleague was mentioning mentioned ports investment, that's a critical pinch point. That's another interdependency, if you like, for a lot of our projects is upgrading the ports. Well, the infrastructure bank investing in ports is, is absolutely key. And once they make those investments, even if they're not huge, it again, it puts that, it comes back to that confidence again. You know, the private sector banks will, will start to look at those schemes by seeing that the the, the, the uh, infrastructure bank has, has invested in them. So I think, you know, the combination of both of them, but particularly that front end to get those projects started is absolutely, is absolutely key. I was going to ask you the, uh, a supplementary question here, but I think you've an answered the question. Yeah, yeah, so, so back to you, Chair. Excellent, thank you. Um, Mark Posey, yeah, you? Th thank you, Chair. I wanted to um, ask some questions about um, introducing local content into uh, these projects. I mean, it's right for lots of reasons, isn't it? It's, it's better for our economy, but it's also pretty important for getting public goodwill and support for the energy transition. Uh, people know that they're going to have to pay for this in uh, th through their energy bills in, in most cases. And if we could say, them, well, you know, uh, we'll, be, we'll be buying British and using British materials as and where we can. So uh, perhaps if I might start with you, Richard, how do, how do, how do we do that? Um, it's currently not permitted in the WTO rules, so we can't mandate a specific UK requirement, uh, and I don't even know whether we're capable of achieving a certain level of UK uh, 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 involvement. But mm. how how can we drive this? Uh, well, the government has a deal with the offshore wind sector to aim for 60% local content by 2030. Uh, so for tidal stream, we're already deploying projects at the moment with over 80% <coughs> UK supply chain content spend. So, for example, Orbital's uh, O2 device in Orkney. It was uh, conceived and designed in Orkney and Edinburgh, you steel from Motherwell, anchors from Anglesey, hydraulics from the Midlands, blades from Solent. It's a real sort of success story across uh, And is that because that, those are the best suppliers to go to with the right price and the right delivery, or is it because there's a, you know, an inherent uh, desire rather than uh, imperative to buy British? I think it's a mixture of both. So all, all our members want marine energy to succeed in the UK uh, and invest in uh, accordingly. However, there's also that the UK is in a leadership position. And so we have companies doing things that are, they are not doing that in other countries. Uh, and one thing that's I think really important to note is that supply chains are incredibly sticky once they've become embedded. Uh, and so what we want to see is sort of UK content, really high levels, not only in projects deployed here, but around the world. And I think we really have an opportunity to do that. Uh, only this morning we had a sort of industry call with the Indonesian government asking about British companies, what the UK government was doing right and wrong and what they can learn from. So there's a, a massive global opportunity here. Yeah, and Jez, how, how can you embed uh, British materials in, in yeah. the projects you, you, you take? I mean, in many cases you're bringing in heavy materials, so it makes more sense to have them locally anyway. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. And there should be a lower carbon footprint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are so many drivers towards it. Yeah, exactly, the lower carbon footprint. Um, if I looked at things like our, uh, we have a social value action plan, which, which in our business commits us to 40% to, to of, the, of the workforce coming from within a 30-mile radius of any project, and that's what we, we strive to achieve. But exactly, exactly right. The same with the materials. We will always try and source those earlier, uh, those closer by, um, and our, and our, our partners, our delivery partners, our subcontract partners but Could as well. an over-commitment to that render some of the projects inefficient, in, in, yeah. in, in, inefficient and uncompetitive. And, yeah. and, and of course, you know, we set it as an absolute target, but of course some of our projects might be in very remote areas where there the simply isn't, so we, we have to be flexible Result. on it, but we set it as a KPI within our business to report against, to strive to get at least 40% within a 30-mile radius of any of, of our projects. Nicholas, in your equipment. Absolutely. I mean, we, we are in, in the same position, but I think there's also an important element here about the definition of the cost of a project, um, because there is the upfront cost and the the emissions are key, and potentially there will be a, a financial cost, a higher financial cost from a UK um, provider compared to a, a foreign provider. But I think where we see a difference, and certainly across across the distribution industry, where there is a huge difference, is that long-term presence and is the long-term cost of the project. If I look at some foreign suppliers, 
it's not just about the, well, it is just about the equipment. And you're looking at pieces of kit that then work for 10, 20, 30 years, and it's about that maintenance and having a foreign Is that a quality issue then? Are you, are you able, it's not able to get the same level of quality if you, if you had a, a domestic approach? It's not a quality issue. The domestic approach allows you to guarantee the, the knowledge and understanding of the product and the right action at the right time in terms of maintenance and upgrades going forward. And this is the fundamental difference to me. If you look at a localized supply chain, you have a much better positioning for the life cycle of the asset and the projects on themselves versus um, foreign supply chain, you always run the risk of you effectively lose the visibility, um, you lose access to the supplier if anything goes wrong or if maintenance is required. And to and me, that's the definition. And is the local see. supply chain able to be competitive? Because you spoke earlier about the need for a constant line of, supp uh, of orders, uh, knowing that there are a series of projects and, the, and the, the supply chain can then invest in them. If that doesn't happen, that you're going to be incentivized to bring stuff in from a, a manufacturer overseas who has got that line of sight. We, we would have to. At the end of the day, we are a business. So yes, we need to make sure that we remain competitive. Um, but again, this is why if I look at how we look at it from a brush standpoint is we try to invest a lot more into the, the, long, um, the long term, into the service cycle of the, the unit where we see our difference. Um, it's not just about manufacturing the unit on day one, it's about super supporting it for the next 20 to 30 years. Okay, I certainly get that, thank you. And, and I want to turn, if I may, to the issue of sort of recycling materials, because I know, uh, Richard, you've had some comments on that. Mm. Um, I mean, how appropriate is that? I mean, everybody wants to see something at the end of life put to a, put to a good use, but technology in this sector, more than anywhere else, is moving very fast and uh, you know when one one uh, uh, product comes so it comes to an end of life it may not be appropriate to use what, because the technology has moved yeah perhaps not but uh, there's so uh, orbital marine power company <coughs> i've already mentioned are working uh with max blade in the university of edinburgh to design uh, its tidal turbine to be uh, completely recyclable um we also have in the wave energy space a swedish company called uh, core power who are looking at using a zero emission steel in its project uh, and then effectively at the end of that they would that that steel would be recycled and used for different purposes having a sort of carbon negative effect um, so we are benefiting from the lessons learned from other renewable technologies and sort of thinking ahead as to what we can be doing with these um, uh, device um, afterwards. Is there any way that government can assist with that? Should, should, should the requirement for reuse be mandated in some way or would that would be uh, would that be unhelpful to your sector? I mean, it could. I think, um, at risk of repeating myself, the, the thing that the government needs to do is provide a clear route and clear it to market and consistently. Uh, and these uh, issues around circularity and recycling, companies are investing in these because it makes business sense to do that as well. And yes, the, the materials you embed in a project are there for many, many years. Um, is, is there any way that re recyclability can be designed in uh, to, to, to ensure that we get this circularity and that uh, scarce materials aren't wasted? Well, we certainly are now reusing materials an awful lot more than we were before. So demolition materials are certainly being, are being used. And yes, to a degree, you can design that into the products we, we are producing now. I think the other area we're looking at is is the ultra low uh, sort of things like ultra low um, carbon concrete, for example, and looking at products like that. And our issue with those is we have developed a, a product which is which is completely cement free now, so it's it's it is ultra low. It's 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 seventy percent less than just low carbon co concrete. Um, the issue with that is around the time because it's a new product. Is is the time it will take to test it and how long it'll be before it can be is widely it used? Is it going to be performing in? 50 years exactly. time and as exactly. we're finding with innovative yeah. Yeah. products in that sector today that were installed yeah. 50 years ago that, that are not yeah. up to scratch and we're trying to encourage clients to to let us use these products where we don't have to meet that that high standard so if it was just a you know some auxiliary parking areas yes. or all of these things is, is is rather than asking for the highest standard can we just relax the standard so we can use these products and have that long-term testing to bring Nicholas, in the products you supply, is there any element of reuse? Presumably, you need to break down the product and then recreate it rather than take a cult component from a, a, a legacy product and try and use it in a, in a yeah. new project. We, we would really have to go back to 
the source material itself, so potentially, but I think it would be difficult. What we're seeing more and more and what we're doing more and more is try to extend the life of the existing assets. So through some targeted maintenance and small upgrades, yeah. you can effectively maintain the vast well, we majority of the assets. We know that from our nuclear fleet, that we, 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 we extended the life there and many areas we've done that. Uh, okay, Chair, that's fine. Though. Lovely, thank you. I might come back to you if you, if you want to yes. come. I've just got a couple of things I want to pick up on myself there. Um, the low carbon cement that, that you mentioned, um, quite interesting. It's obviously not in major circulation at the moment, and it's displaying the same sort of strength as normal Portland mm -hmm. cement cubes at 28 days, showing 40 newton cup, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. And yeah. what, what, what's the cost equivalents at the moment? Yeah, it is quite a, quite a lot more expensive simply because I mean a lot of it is in the batching because it has to be done so bespoke, and you have to have, you know, the the, the way it's the way it's put together. It means you have to take out a batching plant to to produce this cement and, and it's the additional cost in that. So this is a product where the economies of scale, once you can get up to uh, you know, using it more, it'll, the price of it will come right down. But well, moment, for making small mixes and a batch mixer on site by a, a bricklayer or whatever, is, is, is that a possibility? Not, not at the moment, no. At the moment. no it it has to be made in a in special way. Yeah, okay. and, and once you get, because the, I mean, in terms of its performance, its strength, it's very, very good. Um, and all the signs are that, it, that it, it's a product which will this will be a huge reload. Would yeah. you write to the committee a bit more about this? More than that I can, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I just want to ask a general question as well. I mean, people are often concerned in the UK about what the UK can and can't do at the moment. And, you know, thinking back, many people would say there was a, there's a cost to de deindustrialization that's perhaps happened. Would you agree that there's been, um, I'm talking about the, from the 80s and 90s, would you feel that there's any cost to that de-industrialisation de that happened with a lack of skills and a lack of capability now to, to do certain things in the UK that perhaps you might have thought could have happened in the 50s and 60s when the thought of the workshop of the world was, if not immediately there, was certainly a, a, strong, a strong memory of the time. Mm. Is there any legacy from that era that you feel is affecting well, I think looking ahead, one of the benefits of renewables is it provides an opportunity to attract investment into places that sort of have were previously industrialised and perhaps lost industries. So one of the benefits for marine energy is that it attracts a lot of investment to coastal uh, communities. So I'm not entirely sure, but what should or shouldn't have been done, you know, in, in the in the 50s or 80s to sort of avoid. Um, the UK not being as competitive with other countries, but we can learn those lessons now and apply them. Um, and I think there's a sort of consistent message from that, this that panel. Would have quite a bit of government intervention. To, I mean, just leaving the market to do that, is that possible? Or does government have to? I mean, in the United States, for instance, have got the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. which is far from reducing anything. It's, pump, it's the pumping cash into the economy. Act, that's what it is. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I think everyone in the renewable sector would welcome UK governments of having a sort of a similar uh, package as the Inflation Reduction Act. But it doesn't need to be so sort of significant. Like for example, the North Sea Transition Authority, they're sort of targeting 50% uh, carbon emission reductions in its uh, operations and maintenance there by 2030. Uh, now, through that target, we've seen companies like Shell and Total invest in a wave energy project called Renewables for Subsea Power, um, and so that's just the government having a clear target, sticking to it, and sort of letting market forces um, respond to that. So what we really require is that sort of consistency, so a consistent route to market, a clarity of direction, and then private investment will come in. Do you find that in other countries? I mean, is this what Norway does? I mean, who, who despite the inflationary pressures they find of their, of their vast natural resources, are still managing not to deindustrialize, they're managing to build ships and to do loads of other things. Yeah, well, I mean, to give the UK government credit in setting its ring fence, it was demonstrating international leadership in an area that other countries weren't sort of take, taking a lead. Such as? Um, so so, the, so the, well, the UK government set the first ring fence for technology, um, I think, internationally. Uh, and so we uh, should have 100 megawatts deployed by 2028. 20, Globally, there's 20 megawatts deployed. So that's a rapid step change. But when the UK government does that, I mean, I'm, what are we exchanging at the moment? But when the UK government does that, does that necessarily translate into supply chain in the UK or does that necessarily t translate into telephone calls to head offices in, in Denmark or whatever? Yeah. Do, hey, there's a bonanza going on over there. Well, tool up and start making. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, in this in this example, it led directly to the benefit of UK supply chain. So HydroWin, which won a 10 megawatt contract in the last renewable auction, uh, recently opened an office in North uh, Wales specifically to deliver that project. Uh, they're looking at moving their sort of turbine manufacturer into the UK from. as well from the Netherlands. Uh, so that's having a direct and significant supply chain impact. Just before we end, you mentioned the levelised cost of energy earlier against a CFDs. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to give you a little opportunity to expand upon that almost as a tutorial for us on what exactly how, do, how those two things interact and interplay. So the, the CFD is the, the mechanism the government uses to increase yeah. low carbon deployment uh, and projects bid in and they're you win or you lose based on your levelised cost of energy. Yeah. And so that historically wasn't judging on the sort of the broader benefit those different projects would deliver. Yeah. So that's why we had a scenario where we had increased or but decreasing cost of wind, but that was sort of let well, deploying or importing uh, technologies from, from other countries. Um, we're now seeing a slight step change to so the introduced in the sustainable industry uh, rewards. And that will benefit projects which do have and do hit certain uh, local supply chain content targets, do sort of demonstrate they're investing in deprived areas. But and have, have an R&D component as well? Yes, potentially. I think they're still consulting on it, so they haven't yet decided on all the different metrics. Would an R&D component be important to sort of help supply chain grow? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the UK needs significant innovation funding support. But the last point on that new uh, sustainable industry reward is that it's only going to benefit offshore wind, uh, so other technologies don't have access to, to that at the moment. So that's one thing we'd like to see the government change. Final word, any, any and gentlemen, any final observations you might like to make in the in a couple of minutes we have remaining? You don't have to take up the time, but if you've got anything... I was just going to come back on your remark about the deindustrialization, and, and I think you know what we're seeing now is is, uh, is, is a lot of business, a lot of growth in areas like the Humber and like Teesside. So those areas which have been deindustrialized over the past sort of 50 years, I think they're going to see significant growth in those areas and, and a return of, of opportunities and, and jobs and growth for the businesses around there because they are going to be extremely busy areas in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So good news for the economy, if you like, going, going into just yeah. in the industry generally. Yeah. I was going to comment on a very similar vein. I think, as I said earlier, we've got significant skill sets across the UK population. There's a lot of talent that we can build on, and there will be investment. As long as there's clarity on where we want to be, there will be a significant level of investment, and there's a lot to leverage. So to me, it's not all doom and gloom, all the opposite. We're actually at a very exciting time where we can regrow that industry and support our net zero, um, but we've got all the cards in hand now. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all very much uh, for that. That was a very interesting uh, session. It was remembered by McClark, Stephen, Dr. Stephen McGuinness for the mention of Motherwell. He's, of course, from the conurbation of Motherwell and Wishaw, so this will have made his day. Uh, so I think it was Richard who, uh, who made mention of that. Uh, can I thank you all very much uh, for your time uh, this afternoon, and we'll now move to your second panel. But thank you, Richard Arnold, Jess Haskins, and Nicholas. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our second panel of the afternoon, and thank you for your patience and waiting. I hope you enjoyed listening uh, to the first panel there. Uh, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves in the, the usual way I do, name, rank, and serial numbers to give you a, an introduction on your own terms. Uh, I will start on my left, so I'll carry on. I am doing that. Uh, hi, I'm Helena Bennett. I'm Head of Climate Policy at Green Alliance. Um, I am standing in fairly last minute for a colleague, Libby Peake, who you might have been expecting. 
Yeah, we were aware of that. So yeah. thank you very much for right. volunteering to come in front of a parliamentary committee. Luckily, it's Wednesday afternoon, uh, and these uh, colleagues of mine are quite tame, uh, so you'll be okay. Uh, hello, thank you, Chair. My name's George Dib. I'm Associate Director for Economic Policy at IPPR, the Institute for Public Policy Research. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Solomon-Williams. I'm the Executive Director at the Aldersgate Group. We're a multi-stakeholder alliance representing a large number of um, major businesses and other organisations in the UK. OK, I should just maybe caveat, they're only tamed just now because this is their second committee session of today and you're the fourth panel. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, and I'll start, I'll start with the Rottweiler Whitley. Uh, Mike Whitley. Thanks, thanks to you. I'm moderate, but I'm not... Um, <laughs> uh, my question uh, first is to George, uh, my colleague George. Um, how does the UK compare internationally in developing domestic supply chains for emerging energy technologies? So I think uh, at a very top level, and I'm sure that my other colleagues will come in. Uh, the UK is comparatively weak compared to other uh, compared to other developed economies similar to the UK. So first of all. Across the economy as a whole, we have very low levels of private sector investment. Perhaps we'll get into it a little bit, but um, at least the lowest in the G7 and among the lowest in the OECD. That's matched by quite low levels of uh, net zero investment as well. And in fact, recent reports from the OBR show that that's falling from its peak, which is the opposite direction that we want it to be going in. Across a range of different technologies, just picking up on four solar and photovoltaics the uk is extremely weak although that is a common situation across other developed economies um, china is obviously the dominant player in solar but other countries such as germany and france are trying to make efforts in that space the uk has very little um, across wind manufacturing i think that's one of the starkest examples that we can see the uk is a genuine superpower in installing wind power but we are comparatively weak again in our specialization compared to other countries in, within Europe that are manufacturing um, uh, components. So even though we install more than almost anyone else in the world, we don't make as much as anyone else in the world. Um, on batteries and EVs, again, we have closed the gap somewhat with a recent announcement from Tata on a, on a new factory in Somerset. But even looking ahead to future capacity, uh, we will fall by 2030. We're likely to fall behind countries such as Germany, France, and even Hungary. Um, and equally, green hydrogen is a gap that we need to continue to expand into. So I think comparatively, the UK is falling behind and could be doing significantly more on securing the manufacturing benefits of the transition to net zero. What, why, why is that? Is it, is, it, is it the government's fault? Is it the lack of uh, investment by the privates? Uh, so, so I think the, there are different parts to it. The, if you look at that low private sector investment piece, there, is a, there, is, there are various reasons for the UK's low investment. You often hear things like corporation tax raise, which I think we can disregard. I don't think those are the, the biggest problems in the UK system. I would say a significant lack of clear steer from the centre, from government, <laughs> to giving very clear indications to the private sector where future profits and growth opportunities will lie through a very clear industrial strategy is where the UK has been missing out. Um, uh, IPPR research has shown we've had 11 different industrial strategies over the last 14 years. That level of chop and change is extremely damaging to private sector investors who are looking to um, uh, to certainty and that's particularly the case in manufacturing we know that building new manufacturing facilities procuring the equipment that goes into them takes time and has a time lag you need to know that you're going to have that growth opportunity so we need to that, that kind of um it's not just about money it's about the clear steer of where those opportunities will lie that can give firms the security to invest Rachel, would you want to make comments? yeah i think i would add to what george said um the way that policy has been designed in this country, for very good reasons at the time, has been very focused on decarbonisation and technology deployment. So if you think back to the Renewable Energy Directive, where we had a target for 2020 that we interpreted, um, and we've also thought about our carbon budgets, and these are all really great things to do, um, but the focus has always been on how fast can we deploy this technology, how fast can we decarbonise the economy, um, with a very laser focus on those outcomes. And... Um, in designing that policy, we didn't build in uh, industrial outcomes at the same time. And I think that's a lesson we need to learn from other countries who have thought about it in a more holistic way. Um, how can we make sure that future policy 
thinks about the whole system at once. So how can we decarbonise at the same time as taking the supply chain and thinking about how all of that fits together? So, so uh, I'd ask you the question then, is there a lack of drive from the government then, or somebody driving it uh, to, to make sure that we stay on top? Policy that has been designed very explicitly to get certain outcomes from by the government, working with industry, but, but those levers are all completely focused on um, certain change that they want to see, and they haven't built in any incentives, well, I mean, only around the edges, um, for supply chain uh, benefits as well. So I don't blame the government for it, but that's just a, it is a factor of how policy has been designed, and it's something that um, if those other benefits were seen as a good thing, would need to be built in as well. Thanks. Uh, Helena? Um, just going back to your, yeah, I agree with everything the other panellists have said. Just going back to your first question, just to build on what George said, um, the UK compared to other um, economies of similar sizes just does not have access to the raw materials that the US, China and Europe do. Um, and when we do manage to get them to the UK for manufacturing and, and whatever it is, we're also really bad at keeping them here at the end of life. EV batteries, we mostly just export to Belgium to be recycled. We don't have any capabilities of trying to keep stuff here. Um, and I would also agree with the, the point around investor decisions um, in UK manufacturing being poor because of lack of clarity of direction on where, on where policy is and where the future industries of the UK are. That's something that we've noticed a lot in speaking to various different parts of different manufacturing supply chains for net zero industries. And, uh you touched on it before, uh, uh, Dr. Deb, uh, in, re in respect of, uh, are there any particular areas where the UK is a global leader, like you were saying about uh, wind uh, farms? I think the UK is a global leader, but it tends to be further upstream. So in the more innovative areas where the UK has world leading universities and research centres, um, and it does have strengths in some areas of advanced manufacturing, so taking some of the, the high value manufacturing catapult and those kind of interventions, we have historically failed to retain those strengths and feed them through into industry. Um, there are some parts of those supply chains where the UK is strong um, and in fact actually I would argue that part of the problem of these strategies over time from government has that historically the UK government has had quite a muddled view of where it is actually good at manufacturing and in fact whether it's good at all because the UK uh, is, does have areas of comparative advantage um, and actually they tend to get talked down so I think that uh, for example in a wind turbine, the UK has comparative advantage in things like the foundations, the cables, but not, unfortunately, in the bit that has the most high-value manufactured component, which is in the nacelle, the, the turbines. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think that um, we do have areas of advantage, but we have failed to kind of capitalise on them. I'm just going to ask the third point. He's half answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, how effective is the government's engagement with international partners and supply chains? Are there any of the other parts? Uh, uh, Rachel? I think it's been quite um, uneven, is fair to say. So um, there are lots of bilateral conversations that happen with certain other parts of the world about potential deals or corridors. Um, it's not a consistent multi multinational approach to supply chain development. Um, I also think that, generally speaking, the government tends to rely on the private sector to think about the supply chain for itself, um, which is, in a way, fair. So it isn't necessarily the government's job to decide how to access supply chains for private sector investment. Um, but I would suggest a, a separate job, which is to be think thinking about what those supply chains are in aggregate. So what are our needs in terms of green industries? Who's competing with us for those? There will be competition, we know, in the US and EU, um, but elsewhere as well. How can we build up the picture that we can then share with industry to say, I'm saying we, the government can share with industry to say, um, this is how it all fits together and the key relationships that we need to have as a nation. Um, I don't think that's happened so far. It's not been seen as a top priority. There certainly have been good conversations, and we've seen it around the kind of EU exit, where um, ministers have, have started conversations with certain countries bilaterally about where there might be complementary um, kind of skills and engagement, but it's quite... Um, like Denmark and, uh, and, exactly. uh, and Belgium. Yeah. yeah, just just building on that, I, I, I totally agree with with what Rachel said. 
Um, one thing that we aren't doing very well is creating agreements in terms of CRMs with countries that have good ethical standards and environmental standards in place for the products that we're importing. Um, that there's a lot of news and press around things happening in the DRC, for example, and, and different parts of South America. There are other places that those a lot of those materials can be found, and we're not exploiting relationships um, with those countries in a, in a constructive way yet. Um, I think in terms of just more broadly the UK's approach, we've, we've typically been a leader in a lot of this stuff, and so haven't needed to consider a scenario where, as Rachel says, every other country in the world is going to start wanting access to different materials and supply chains. So we do need a strategy going forward about what the UK's role in that wider ecosystem looks like, because it's just not been considered at the moment. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Can, um, I mean, you've told us that, you know, we should have done better, we've developed, we've installed lots of wind turbines, but we haven't built them. Um, do you think, and perhaps this is one for Helena, really, do you think that's had an attitude, a, 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 a contribution to public attitude? So do you think that if consumers knew that there was an industrial dimension to onshore uh, wind yeah. turbines, there might be more uh, support for the principle. I mean, I, my own view is that public views have changed. Um, certainly, uh, <coughs> 10 years ago, much resistance. We've got effectively a moratorium right now. But m my own view is that having had an energy crisis, uh, people understand uh, the need to, to, to create more of our domestic energy through uh, uh, through renewables, but if we were able to say, and of course, you know, there's a benefit to the economy and jobs because these are being manufactured here, there would be more support. Is there any evidence that people know and understand that we haven't got that in industry in place? It's it's coming. I think there's a plant about mm -hmm. in the process of being created in Teesside. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to demonstrate domestic supply, there would be more public support. I don't have any evidence, no, I don't, I don't know if any research on that kind of thing has been done, actually, other, other panellists might have some, but um, I wouldn't doubt that there is a correlation um, with being able to see direct jobs and local, um, local kind of success in, in manufacturing and creating skills, etc., and, and exporting as well. I think the same could be also said probably for heat pumps. We don't really have mm. any heat pump manufacturing capabilities in the UK, and, and but again, public opinion line of heat of pumps is we heard quite in the low. previous uh, session about the need for a line of sight in a project. People know that heat pumps are coming, and people like Valent and Bosch are starting to switch over from uh, you know, gas boiler manufacture to heat pumps. But it's a, ma a matter of knowing w what the future holds. Yeah, and, and I think there's an element of the, that phrase, the just transition, in there as well, of, of understanding which jobs those could be replacing and a lot of the frustration with a lot of in old kind of polluting industries obviously in the UK is that it's, there's not a clear pathway to what happens next which we know there's lots of evidence that has caused friction with with transitioning to net zero um, so I do imagine I don't know if there is evidence but I do imagine there is a pathway exactly as yeah. you say that seeing these industries in the UK might lead to more acceptance of them yeah. Um, I think it's helpful if we look at historical precedent as well. So um, West Cumbria and Sellafield, if you talk to residents of West Cumbria about how they feel about working on radioactive waste yeah. and being part of that industry, um, I could find data for this, but broadly speaking, it's a very positive response. They've seen the impact that this it has for them. This committee visited a few years ago. Yeah. They, they, um, it, certainly got that they, they can see yeah. all the economic benefits that flow to the area um, through the jobs that cool. um, that provides. If you ask somebody from nearly everywhere else in the country, would you like to work on radioactive waste? Probably not. Yes. Um, and that's, that's just a lack of understanding and um, a lack of engagement with what those jobs mean and how it works and what the benefits are and so on. Um, Same people on watching this. Simpsons then. <laughs> right, yeah. No. I think if, yes, uh, I, I'm not familiar with uh, the evidence base behind <laughs> the Simpsons, but um, I know what you mean. The levity there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, can we learn from those existing examples? There are probably others as well, where something that doesn't sound attractive or might not be something you choose to have located in your area um, would be much more attractive with familiarity and with understanding the challenges that it brings. Steel plants. Really exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, just want to pick up on a couple of things before I move on a little bit. Uh, Rachel Solomon Williams, you painted a picture of the, sort of the UK government providing a big sort of picture of governments generally in the UK providing a big picture, but not actually paying attention to, to the detail. I'm trying to sort of put a bit of more colour on this. Are you, the thing that I'm seeing, and you sort of described, it's like a farmer who thinks he knows the crop he wants to plant and grow, so he plants the seeds. 
and then walks away and just hopes the weeding will happen, hopes the pests will be under control, hopes the place will be fenced, and then comes back and sees whatever crop he's got at the end or she's got at the end. Is that fair? I think it's been built in by design. So um, it hasn't been a priority for quite a long time to um, build in industrial benefits to a range of policies. Do you um, think other countries do that? Other countries do that. And obviously the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the US has built that in very clearly. They've come at their whole policy uh, framework from a completely different point is of it, view. Is, is that, I'm sorry, to yeah. but it's kind of, it's, is that because there's this almost of an article of faith or belief in the UK in this mythic thing called the market? That's sort of a, a, you know, going back to the invisible hand of the market, which is probably is the clues in the name, it's invisible, it's searching around in the dark blindly, but, you know. So it's obviously the prevalent view and also makes a lot of sense in theory that if you create a market and then let it service itself, um, you'll get the most economically sensible result. Um, that doesn't take into account extreme differences of cost in different countries for producing that. Next door with a system brain, if you like. Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's why we welcome the CBAM announcement that was, be, was made before Christmas, um, because that begins to level the playing field a bit between um, UK industry and other parts of the world. Um, I do think it's it's quite a big political decision in a way as to whether the UK... It's almost a philosophical change, isn't it? it it's a, yeah, exactly. The, it can be done if a choice is made, yeah. um, but it's very much a political decision which then needs to be followed with specific interventions to make it happen. Um, and that's it, it has been a choice, and I don't, that's not a criticism particularly. So taking that philosophy, to go back to something Helena said earlier about the uh, EV batteries and recycling, and you said that's done in Belgium. So a good number of questions about that. I didn't know much about that. So is that done in Belgium because they, they're sort of a European centre for it, or are they done in Belgium because the Belgium is the closest market to here, like at the closest location to, it's just over, over a ferry ride from Dover or whatever, uh, for, from the UK that you could take these batteries to, and why hasn't the market, invisible or system brain, thought about doing something somewhere else without the, the, the ferry ride to the continent? Yeah, it's both really. Um, there, there's a big centre of excellence there, and we don't we don't have anywhere in the UK that can do it at scale at the moment. Are they the centre of excellence for France, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium? I I believe a lot of places are sending. Yeah, I believe other countries are sending some of their recycling uh, or recyclable materials there. Um, but that that's that's where the UK is almost exclusively sending. Anyth- well, not even anything we can recycle. There's a lot of stuff that we're not recycling, and we should be as yeah. well. We have some... That would almost require an intervention then to sort of plant that seed at least to go back to farming and Aldi to provide something that would start to grow. There are some centres of excellence in the UK that are doing really cool stuff. So, so, the, so the thing with Umicore in, in Belgium as well is it's not a perfect system. They're not able to extract everything that we yeah. could extract. Um, bat- EV batteries getting more complicated they're getting bigger, there's more materials in them um, they're all manufactured in different ways, there's not one u- kind of universal battery that goes yeah, into every yeah. EV mm-hmm. um, and there are some really good innovative um, things happening at various academic institutions in the UK around recycling and how to extract the most possible material um, th- that we could the problem with what happens and this is just out, outside of batteries as well but with a lot of really a lot of this really good innovation in the UK is there's just not the translation into a viable business in the UK and a lot of innovation that's happening at our academic institutions is going elsewhere because there isn't that kind of valley of death between the small startup and, and where we want to get commercially so the University of Warwick for example WMG they've got some really good stuff going on with the black matter of batteries and how to extract I can't remember the exact number, really, really high percentage of the materials that's in, not just EV batteries, but even batteries you get in tiny little, I don't know, like teddies that light up or whatever. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're struggling a little bit with funding and they're also uh, not able to kind of scale up at the rate they want to um, in a way that is happening elsewhere outside of the UK. Thank you. Um, George, if we, to go to you, I mean... Sort of to, to, to look at this maturely and not to be overly critical, but there'll be some countries, and we're, and we're looking at this from a supply chain thing, there'll be some countries doing things better than the UK, and perhaps there are other areas when the UK is doing things better, but we're looking at sort of uh, domestic supply chain in and around energy here. And can you look at 
specific examples or approaches from other countries where the UK could potentially learn from. I think you hinted at it quite early on. I'm just giving you more chance to, to, to flesh that out. Yeah, I think there are a few examples that we can focus on, and uh, Rachel already mentioned the US, so I'll come back in a second to talk about the kind of approach from the um, Inflation Reduction Act. But we can look quite close at hand, for, for example, at uh, France and the approach it's taken on industrial policy. So if we go back to my example earlier, which is of offshore wind, where we had actually some really world-leading policy development of Contract for Difference invented here in the UK using that auction methodology to really drive cost reduction and installation. But we weren't having the same level of innovation on that kind of manufacturing policy and developing the conversations with those actual firms, the people who are going to be building factories and making things. And I think that's because partly, as you said, a bit of a lack of kind of desire to intervene in the free market. Um, and to kind of extend your analogy further, we've left it up to the market which seeds get planted rather than actually going out and planting the seeds ourselves and oh, deciding okay. which areas okay. we want to be in. Um, I think we're a multi crop growing up, not selling. Yeah, crop or maybe too many weeds knocking yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Although stretching the tenu tenacity of the metaphor uh -huh. a bit. In France, they have always had a much closer relationship and conversation between individual firms and the state. And we haven't had that same approach. And I think that leads to us being strong. When you have the media here saying, oh, that's corruption, look at the government designing this so that these people can produce or recycle EV batteries, for example, just given some... I mean, is there a risk of that? There is always a risk of that, but equally there's a risk of missing out on opportunities if we don't have clear conversations between, the, between government and between business, especially in um, a transition to net zero, which is fundamentally going to require the production, purchase, adoption, deployment of lots of new technologies, manufactured technologies. And the states that are going to likely to be winning in that are the ones who understand that it's intervening, or understanding at least, the individual firm level decisions of how a manufacturer decides what to make which is going to actually going to win that, that race. So, for example, France has a much lower level of offshore wind installation than the UK, a target of 2030 target one-tenth of the UK government, yet they're involved in quite active conversations with firms and have, since 2016, really expanded their manufacturing capacity to overtake and leapfrog the UK. We could be, we know, looking ahead, we know we're going to market, we know the direction we're going in, we have a very clear target on offshore wind installation. We need to be identifying now that there's probably going to be a global bottleneck in that supply chain, and therefore we should strategically be seeking to expand our capacity in the UK. And then the other example, which we probably have to discuss, is around the, the USA and the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as other um, industrial policies. We would say that we need the similar level of ambition of the Inflation Reduction Act in the UK, if not exactly replicating the tools. So the US uh, government, the Biden administration, were particularly constrained politically. They had a majority of one in the, in the Senate, um, which meant they were constrained on what they could get through legislatively. That meant really their only option was tax credits. They designed the Inflation Reduction Act with that in mind. We don't have the same restrictions, actually. The UK can use a much broader range of tools, industrial policy tools, um, that already exist in, the, uh, in government departments to try and align and, uh, and, and implement an industrial strategy. But we probably need to be also more focused on which areas we do so. Um, but I think that kind of ambition, the very clear certainty um, that the US has been able to put under those sectors uh, has been transformational. You can see some incredible numbers about factory construction in the US is, is, is increasing almost exponentially. And partly, again, going back to that point around certainty for firms, certainty for manufacturers, that's because they're thinking about those tax credits on a 10-year timescale. So it gives those firms a decade-long certainty. Going back to that, that figure, we've had so much chop and churn in the last 10 years, that would be really desirable in the UK if we're going to try and transform those supply chains. That's good. I suppose I've just seen them in a different way when you're speaking, that, that rather than government spend, they're just for, for going tax, basically, and it's, it amounts in, in, a way to, in a way to much the same. Rachel, any, any particular thoughts on, on what you've heard from, from George? I think I would uh, 
build on George's point about um, security of supply. So I think a lot of this conversation so far has assumed that you would have a, an industrial supply chain in this country for economic reasons, in the sense that it brings investment flows and therefore jobs and all those other good mm -hmm. things. Um, if we could reframe it to be much more about energy security. So we have a national emergency plan for fuel, for example, where we recognise that we always need to keep fuel flowing in order to maintain our emergency services and all those things. Um, we will also need a continuity of supply of all these critical raw materials, um, copper, all these supply chain um, items, which need to be considered as a critical part of... How the UK secure them, that, that supply? We need to make sure we have access to them. That's the, that's the main thing. Yeah. Everybody else will be thinking about that too. Um, you could argue that producing them in this country or carrying out manufacturing in this country would significantly contribute to that security of our energy supply in the future. I mean, you, globally, the, the world's going to... I'm going back to evidence from the Joint Committee of the National Security Strategy. Well, I mean, the world and copper. You know, in Chile and Peru are now having sort of um, worries about more mining of copper in Chile and Peru and then there's uh, concerns within, within that society so that's clearly creating a pinch point. How do you get around that sort of stuff? Because it's quite real in Chile and Peru and if you then go into the parliament in Santiago or Lima or somewhere, my constituents don't want this to help the people in London, Paris, Copenhagen, whatever. I think we need to start by understanding the vulnerability we have. I'm not sure that uh, as a nation we understand what our needs are going to be and where those vulnerabilities are. I know there was some work done um, during Covid for example about our supply chain vulnerabilities because it became um, particularly tricky at that time. But I, there isn't a publicly available document I'm aware of. Um, that would be a great place to start. Um, we could understand what's going on in Chile and Peru and where else might the sources be? What could we do more on circularity? Um, we haven't discussed circularity, but making sure that we can keep as much, um, I know the previous panel picked up on that, keep as much within this country as possible and design with that in mind. Okay, um, thank you. I think um, looking at the, you know, where are those, those vulnerabilities going forward? You're aware of your own security. You're talking about of being um, being aware of what you have, but you also need to be aware of what other where other countries are as well. And no country is going to be fully secure in any of this. You can get to a point of probably optimal security, but you're not going to get any further. So we're going to always have to live with an inbuilt insecurity in all this. Would you, would you agree with that as well? I mean, there, there's a certain paradox in the middle of all this. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And as I think being aware of it is a very good start. Let me just ask a yeah. supplement to that. Is, um, I mean, you spoke about um, what happened in COVID when you know, there was a shortage of chips and we covered that with the effect on automotive. But do you think we neglect these things because they're going all right at the moment? And, and it will only take a bottleneck sure. yeah. in, a, in a commodity and us not to be able to get a hold of it to um, broader manufacturing, but particularly for this sector, that will then say, why didn't we do something ages ago? And how, how serious do you think of a, a critical mineral? How serious do you think a, a, a shortage is likely to happen? Um, firstly, it's, I mean, there are a lot of crises happening in this country at the moment, which we don't need to discuss, but naturally the government ha focuses on problems that are happening then, today, sure. and that's completely understandable. It's much harder to do big strategies based on a problem that hasn't happened yet. Um, I, I don't know whether um, Helen wants to pick up on the critical given, materials. Given point. a fairness to the government in a democracy, you're going to see a horizon that's probably not stretching much further in the Treasury beyond November this year. I mean, the average West Highland crofter, of which I count myself one, is maybe looking at a three, four, or eight, three, four year horizon and breeding just a few sheep. So you're actually looking further than the UK yeah. Treasury is, and that's just about the very nature. And that's not a criticism. Whoever would be there is it's probably a flaw within democracy that's causing that. Well, to be fair, on critical minerals, there is, um, there is already a strategy that's been produced, and that just needs to be implemented. Okay. So um, we've got a starting point, and getting out the blocks and, and delivering some of that would be really good. Just, I think the, one of the issues with, we mentioned, mentioned it already, lack of industrial strategy and direction of policy, etc., is also the fact that industrial strategy for, around manufacturing for the net zero transition is not being relate, tied very closely to the net zero strategy that the government has. And one of the things that will make a really big difference to security of supply and then what we're able to keep in the country 
is reducing demand in the first place. There are massive savings that can be made across transport, buildings, energy production. Some analysis um, that we've done shows that we could reduce demand for lithium and cobalt 55% by 2030 from current projections. How would you do that? Just a quick... Insulating homes, so you need less energy for um, heat pumps. More public transport, so you have fewer CRMs needed because you're selling fewer electric vehicles. I know that's not a very popular thing to say in, yeah, a, okay. in an environment where we're saying we want more you know, EV manufacturing. You know, All those, thinking about different ways we can reduce our overall energy usage. There are lots of different elements to the whole picture. If we looked at them properly all together, yeah, we would... All of those in detail would be quite uh, pleased to, to, to get that written evidence. Just put a hand over to Mark Posey. I think the committee were in... When the committee were in Denmark or Belgium last week, they heard that there was no way for European net zero in energy without, as they put it, UK wind, uh, which I thought was quite interesting uh, and an opportunity. Of course, being a Scottish nationalist, I pointed out that was Scottish wind, but um, we'll leave that where it is. Mark Posey. It was, it was UK wind, not uh, energy produced from UK manufactured wind turbines. And, oh, and sorry. Uh, of course, and that's, that's, that's what we're focused on. And we recovered this a little bit, but we'll see BAM help. Uh, by building in the carbon uh, element to those that, the products that do come in from elsewhere? So I think that a CBAM certainly would be welcome in that it would um, have three main reasons that it would reduce so-called carbon leakage. Yeah. So firstly, um, it would uh, prevent kind of domestic increases in carbon pricing on uh, low carbon products. Second, help stop domestic interests from, uh, domestic industries from being at a competitive disadvantage from firms overseas that don't have the same kind of rigorous and high standards that we do. Um, and third, by linking, there's a big potential from linking a UK CBAM, which the government has committed to, to an EU one, it would potentially reduce trade barriers between the UK and the and EU. And again, I think, would you, say, would you say that it helps with the selling of the principle of the, the move to low carbon technologies? Because you know, we, can de we can demonstrate that by manufacturing here, we're creating you know, allowing less to be created in other markets. Well, the great concern is that you know we might be importing uh, EVs for to the UK, but there may be EVs that are manufactured in another country where the source of power may continue still be coal. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, does the does the public understand those principles? I mean, that's probably why game for Helena in terms of any uh, public uh, uh, surveying your organisation has done. Um, I. I I don't have any evidence, but I can't imagine that understanding about that is very high yeah, at all. Exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't imagine so. Yeah. Although I do think that there probably is some salience to the idea that if we want to transition to net zero, it's counterintuitive we'd do so relying on countries yeah. that are high coal emitters or perhaps not with the highest standards that we might expect of kind of worker rights, etc. So like trying to embed those broader progressive principles within mm. within the core policy programme seems to make sense to me. And there's a reason for us not to aim to manufacture everything for example is because there will be certain components that are very specialist and there will be economies of scale and it may make more sense to source um, a high volume com uh, component manufactured at low cost simply by virtue of that than trying to manufacture a relatively small quantity for our own market are there areas examples that you can give us where that may that, that may apply yeah I, I think it's absolutely right that the UK should not be approaching this as a question of trying to be an autarky and create manufacture every single component we need in the North UK. Korea, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in chip, we've taken that view in chips, haven't we? We are not attempting to make volume chips. We're making high uh, quality chips in the, in the UK, but leave it, leaving the mass market to somebody else who's better at it. Yeah, and I think one of the areas where that's particularly stark is probably on PV, on photovoltaics, given that so much of the manufacturing is concentrated on China given the trajectory around kind of wider geopolitics, what that might mean for countries in the West. I think going back to the example of the US um, Inflation Reduction Act, that is generally seen to be pretty technology neutral, but I think that's not right. I think it is technology specific. It's just technology specific in every different technology. So the, the Inflation Reduction Act has got something like 100 uh, different programs within it to incentivize different areas of different um, Supply chains. I don't think oh, it's, it's also got low content, uh, local content in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and but it's but it really is spreading the bets across the range of technology. And I, we wouldn't 
advocate for the UK to do the same. I, but I do think that sometimes, and even in this conversation, we've kind of muddled some of the concepts of there are areas where we will want to seek to be strong and expand and produce more because we have a comparative advantage and there's an economic benefit to be had there. There are a series of technologies which we will want to have because they're critical for the transition and if we don't have them here in the UK, we're going to be exposed to national security risks. And there will just be a third category of things which may never be economically beneficial, but we still want to retain. And there I'm thinking of things like flat steel and things which are critical to wider to supply chains. So th there are different reasons to be intervening in these things that might call for different tools. You know, a quick question. When the uh, Ukraine war started, uh, no one, no one, no one foreseen uh, about the gas price uh, because at that time people were saying, "Oh, we only get two percent. We only uh, import two percent from uh, uh, um, Ukraine." Now we've seen what happens. The, the prices went viral. Do you know what I mean? And you know, we haven't learned. I don't think we haven't learned a lesson for that. So what we need to do is, if we're, if we're going to get like wind power, wave power, tidal power, solar power, we need to make sure. You know that we've got enough. Uh, uh, you know, of them commodities. Uh, Pricing is is insulated from, from yeah, yeah, shocks. Yeah. So, so we we're not going to get a shock again. And some of this shouldn't necessarily be a shock, right? Like we know the transition to net zero, we know the technologies we need, and we can already see that we're likely to have bottlenecks in the future because we don't have the announced capacity for 2030. So doing a bit of that look ahead with a strategic eye and then matching it with what we can do in the UK is probably the right plan going forward. One of the advantages of developing strong domestic supply chains has been cited as the increasing potential for exports. What is the current status of exports from UK manufacturing in the low carbon sector? I'll take Rachel first. Or <laughs> whoever. Uh, I, I can talk on EVs for a little bit because that's oh, yeah, something we've done quite a lot of research on. Um, potential is good, if that's what the question is. Um, <laughs> we um, we have a in, there's an interesting relationship between the UK's zero emission vehicle mandate and EV manufacturing. We export the majority of the cars we manufacture here, and there was a question on the previous panel about um, how we're going to meet all our targets with the ban on petrol and diesel vehicle sales by 2035, because we don't we aren't projected to have that many CRMs. But we won't only be producing electric vehicles in 2035. It's likely that a lot of manufacturers will still produce some petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, we, our biggest market is the EU. The EU is also introducing um, regulation to phase out petrol and diesel vehicles. So that relationship is actually, uh, and as much as from a Green Alliance perspective, we didn't agree with the Prime Minister's removal of the ban on, pe on petrol and diesel vehicle sales in 2030, it now aligns with what the EU is doing. So from a manufacturing perspective, actually some of what they were saying was, well, now it just makes our job a little bit easier because we don't have to worry about the fact that we might not be able to sell or we might not be able to sell some of the vehicles that we wanted to, um, which which means that for what we're continuing to sell here, we will need to make sure that we have the CRMs we need to produce the vehicles we need. And because the majority export market is the EU and our regulation now aligns with the EU, we also have to make sure we've got enough CRMs to sell that 80% that's going to the EU. Um, and at the moment, we, we don't. And the, that going back to that recycling point, we're going to have to make sure that we're keeping CRMs in the UK if we want to make sure that we can keep manufacturing with the uncertainty of global supply chains that, that's continuing as well. So I would add to that on the export side um, to say I, I would suggest we think about it in a wider frame. So if you're specifically thinking about export of materials for clean energy, that's very niche kind of conversation. Um, there's obviously a wider conversation about where our comparative advantage is in the industrial sector. So chemicals, non-ferrous metals, beverages, um, we do really well compared with other countries in terms of our export um, kind of percentage. And it's a helpful conversation to have in that wider frame. Um, it feels like slightly a red herring uh, in the specific niche that we're talking about for this inquiry in the sense that we are nowhere near the capacity to be exporting really at this time. I don't have a huge answer, I don't, apart from, I think, joining those two ideas up, that 
I would agree we need to really concentrate on expanding capacity to fulfil our own kind of domestic needs. But then there are areas, as Helena highlighted, where there is a significant net zero challenge in our current industrial strength. So that leads you to cars and exports, which already make up, as, uh, sorry, cars and EVs, which already make up a significant proportion of our export strength. We really want to make sure we're embedding in that the direction that sector's moving. We've seen the content of EVs as a proportion going up over time. So making sure we specialise in that would be an export strength I would identify. Are there any areas where there might be a particularly strong incentive for growth? I would suggest, um, so this is, again, slightly tangential, but carbon capture is, we have an enormous kind of natural advantage compared with everywhere else in Europe, for example, in terms of the resources available for storing captured carbon. Um, the government's actually doing a really good job of trying to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, I haven't got line of sight into what they're doing around the supply chain for that, but that's another decarbonisation industry and will support kind of green industries in the future. So it's, it's important to consider in this wider energy conversation. Um, Isn't that another of those sort of farm risks? Whatever seeds in the next thing is, we want to do this, but basically sort of do it yourselves and income companies from all over the world and, and take advantage of that opportunity. So I'm not close to the detail of how no. the supply the chain aspect is working, but it's, it is an exciting opportunity because it's happening now and they haven't quite started during, doing the kind of holes in the ground yet, as it were. But, um, but isn't it a long way away? We were in Denmark last week and we saw a plant being manufactured immediately adjacent to a power station where they are building the equipment for carbon capture. So, again, are we, are we just a bit behind the curve? I don't know the detail, but I'm happy to send some more information right, about it. Help. There, there is a, a couple of other areas, actually. In transport, um, there aren't any kind of big hubs for manufacturing mm -hmm. zero-emission buses, light vehicles, e-scooters, and HGVs as well yet. And that could be some, you know, we've got an excellent automotive industry here. It could be something that we start exploiting if we can access the CRMs that we need to. Um, the other area, which is not, anyth it's not anything that will be really tangible in the next half decade, um, but based on our, again, historical excellence in manufacturing is um, zero emission aircraft. And part of that, part of the reason I say that is we've got a little bit of government guidance on what the future of zero emission flights could look like in the UK through the Jet Zero strategy. There isn't yet a policy framework to surround how that commercialises and scales up. And neither is there an industrial strategy for how we could start actually building and innovating more, more widely here. And it's an example of we're right at the kind of nascent start of that technology coming um, onto the centre stage. And so it's a, it's a really good example of where the government could actually marry the net zero targets and an industrial strategy together in a way that is then exported all over the world and it's just not being considered in that way at the moment. And if I were to highlight any areas of strength, I think similar to Helena, there are some in the transport sector, so manufacturing of trains uh, and electric vehicles is a strength that the UK has. Um, heat pumps, I think it was mentioned by one of my colleagues earlier that we don't currently have very strong heat pump manufacturing, but we do have strengths in air conditioning manufacturing, which shares lots of the technological components. Um, so there's some kind of potential there. And the UK does have strengths in kind of wider grid technologies as well. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, IPPR is currently undertaking some research, doing a survey across all green supply chains to identify current and potential areas of um, comparative advantage, which I'd be happy, we'll finalise in the next month, and I'd be happy to share with the committee. I guess thinking about, though, are we a bit behind? Yeah, undoubtedly, we are a bit behind. But I don't think some of those things actually take as long as uh, to catch up as potentially some people fear. Um, looking at how long it takes to bring, for example, a, a wind turbine on the cell manufacturing facility online, um, it's a, a matter of two to three years. And yes, the expense is significant, but it's not on the scale of a semiconductor fab or some of these other big capital outlays. So some of them may be quicker and cheaper to bring online than, than some might fear. I've got just one thing to add to that in terms of UK advantage, um, which is we haven't mentioned the services sector. We obviously have fantastic professional services in this country, um, especially in green finance, um, but also legal and strategy consulting, where they're not supply chain in the sense of physical materials, but they're an incredibly important part of delivering a lot of these energy systems. Um, and so that's something to kind of support and celebrate and remember that we do have. Just a quick point, if I can. Um, you made an interesting point there of comparative advantages. You mentioned a few times, so you mentioned a bit of muddled thinking and just making sure you've, we, we're not 
overlapping things and choosing mm. pet projects or whatever, um, or things that spring to mind. But is there a list of the comparative advantages? You've mentioned them a few times, and why they are comparative advantages? Yeah, so that is the work that we're currently looking at. So I think the, there's some work already out there from uh, LSE and the Centre for Economic Performance. There'll be a central point we can all go to and look, these are the comparative. Yeah, so we'll certainly be publishing that work and it's across all of the green supply chains and looking at where our present comparative advantages are. We'll also be looking at where those are located geographically in the UK as well. So, um, Didn't mean to interrupt Mr Whitley for too long. But no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Uh, My last question is... Uh, is, he, is there enough alignment between domestic and international standards and materials or products for exports to be feasible and practical? We would love to see much more aligned product standards um, internationally. It would help um, producers enormously. Uh, in some cases, there just aren't any, many cases, in fact. Um, and it's a point that we've been making repeatedly around the kind of industrial transition um, that aligned product standards is incredibly helpful and it brings down cost as well as empowering the kind of domestic supply chain. Well, I, there's some things I think my colleague Libby, who should have been here today, will have to say about that, so happy to share details. Yeah, it's not my area of expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I just want to pick up the point that uh, George made about the Inflation Reduction Act and also the measures that the EU have brought. Um, I mean, do you think that the government's response is adequate? I mean, it, it, it tends to be on a piecemeal thing, so a very substantial investment uh, in Somerset to build EVs for uh, domestic automotive, um, substantial investment in Port Talbot in converting uh, steel production uh, to arc furnace using um, previously used steel. but. It, I mean, is it enough? Do we need to? Do, does the UK need to be as generous as in, its, in its incentives as as uh, the US and perhaps those of Europe? Or is there st are, we, are we making a step in the right direction? Would a and would a more strategic, uh, uh, sort of announced and stated uh, policy be helpful in your view? Yes, yeah, so uh, my view, taking a step back and comparing the UK's approach to both Europe and the US, is that the UK's approach is currently inadequate. They haven't. Uh, I think stepped up to the challenge in the way that some other countries have so um, there is obviously concern around kind of a subsidy race but I don't think that is necessarily what we're seeing I think what we're seeing is a correct step in the right direction of an increase in the ambition that other countries are taking and the UK is behind Do you think stepping back and just uh, looking at it on a project by project basis is a better way than publishing, you know, anybody that wants to do this, we're going to lob all this amount of taxpayers' money at it. Sure, uh, absolutely. And I think that in some areas the UK is making uh, uh, steps in the right direction. There are specific strategies that we've highlighted already today. But the Inflation Reduction Act is not just throwing money at the wall and seeing what sticks. There are 104 different programmes within that which are focused at very specific levels of the, of the supply chain. I think it's a, a targeted programme. I wouldn't advocate taking the same approach in the UK given the means of getting the money out through tax credits. I think we could adopt a much more targeted supply side approach. And also because we have more political latitude means that we can also match regulations, the things that Helena was talking about to reduce demand, means that actually we can get better bang for our buck. Uh, we can get more effective public spend because we can use both a carrot and a stick, whereas the Americans are only using that kind of tax credit. Right. Okay, carrot. thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Isn't the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA similar to World War II in a way, similar to NASA, the NASA program, which threw up nylon, teflon I should say, um, it's basically a big fiscal stimulus that's coming under some guys that basically gets the economy moving and gunked up because you're providing the magic money that he's been sh shook, uh, the money's coming out, the grease is in the engine of the economy, the economy's growing and so it's moving faster, producing more stuff um, and essentially what it's all about, yeah of course it's the targeting but it's the en enabling of that money into the economy to get capital shifting and ability shifting. I, can I come in on this? Because I yeah. don't think that we should assume that in the UK throwing a lot of money at the problem is necessarily what, what's needed, actually. But by um, throwing in a targeted way, as war did, as yeah, NASA Yes, so, I mean, it doesn't hurt, and it will yeah. certainly create stimulus of a kind, um, but there are other factors to take into account. So um, we have double uh, the industrial energy price, uh, for example, compared with the EU. 
and doing business through the use of energy in production is incredibly expensive. So what are the levers that we could pull to think about redesigning electricity prices and electricity costs for mm -hmm. high energy consumers? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean to me, need to be a grant of any kind, um, but it's a policy design that could significantly unlock a lot of investment, for example. We would look at the, economy, the economics of energy, we think, at some stage, uh, yeah. and zonal and nodal energy, which will have a, a change on, on, that, on that very thing. Absolutely, and it plays straight into the supply chain conversation, because if you can start manufacturing at a sensible cost, um, you don't need an extra grant to help you do that. That's a very simplistic um, summary, but uh, yeah, our, our industrial energy prices are very high. Um, there are other things we can do in terms of regulating um, requirements of all sorts. I mean, we talked about product standards. Um, we've got a very good, I always use this example, but I think it's very good, um, a mandate for the supply of low carbon fuels into this country. Um, we could think about other sorts of mandate and regulatory support that don't cost anything directly to the taxpayer, but they spread cost across the um, industrial sectors in a fair sort of way. So it creates an additional cost, um, but it doesn't lay it um, directly through taxes. So um, we're very good at doing that. We're very good at making policy in this country when we choose to do that. Um, there are also things about how we use UK We're also quite, quite good at sticking with the wrong policy. Well, <laughs> perhaps. It depends what you're trying to do with it, I suppose. Okay. Um, the UK Infrastructure Bank exists exactly to do this kind of thing. Um, I would say it's been quite conservative to date about how it's used its funding, um, but it does have loan guarantees as a lever it can pull, okay. um, which don't go on the taxpayers, they don't go on the balance sheet. Um, and deployment of those loan guarantees into um, kind of supply chain initiatives <coughs> that really need them, um, and uh, you know that that could be another way of helping out as well. It was in. Um, any f final observations, Helena and George? Uh, just to completely back up what Rachel just said, like, there are so many other levers we can pull apart from just funneling capital into into these industries. But I do think more capital does need to go into these <laughs> industries still. I mean, the, the, the closest we've got to a government response to IRA was, I think it was about $4.5 billion announced in the autumn statement for various things, including gigafactories and, and steel and things. Um, which when you when you compare to the sums that IRA technically equivalates to within 10 years is kind of pennies really we did so a piece it's not a per capita match not oh not even close no, no, no. not even close no 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 we're talking about like hundreds of billions of IRA yeah. um I just just one example I don't know if you can tell but I've done a lot of work on EVs um we looked at what I, I had figured it we, <laughs> we looked um at what the equivalent of all the kind of tax credits add up to that the, they're giving out in the US for UK the size of the UK market uh -huh. by 2030, it will cost 65 billion pounds, which is you know two thirds mm. of HS2 almost, just just for EVs. So that is the equivalent for the UK of what the Americans spend on EVs. Yeah, per capita. I see. Yeah. We we can share that analysis with you. Yes, that was really fascinating. Yeah, I th very much agreeing with Helena and Rachel. I would guide against talking about this as shaking magic money tree kind of policy. There is. There are many things that UK can do in terms of carrot and stick that are not cost on the exchequer. Having, an, in fact, an industrial strategy, thinking about it as shaping markets, uh, I think is really... Uh, yeah, IRA is magic money tree. I mean, where did the money come from? It they're borrowing it. It's entirely legitimate. From, from themselves? No, from, no, not from themselves. They're borrowing it's it on international in, markets, right? They, 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 it's, they're raising bonds, and it's absolutely legitimate for governments yeah, yeah, to yeah, borrow yeah, yeah, to invest in future economic yeah. growth. A left hand borrows them from from the right hand most of the time with government when they have a big. Anyway, let's not get let's not get into the government. Regardless of uh, uh, yeah where the borrowing comes from, yeah, the, it's not just about spending money, and there's a huge amount of potential for the UK to do a lot more. Comparing, for example, you you compared it to NASA and the moonshot. I think look at what the UK government did with the development of the COVID vaccine with AstraZeneca. There are things government can do which aren't necessarily about funneling money in. Yeah. For example, we used a purchase guarantee. We said, look, we're going to need to buy millions of these doses from whoever successfully manufactures a vaccine that works. That gives firms the security to invest. That's exactly what we're talking about. You're going to spend that money anyway. So I do think all of those things are right. But like Helena, the UK is way behind the curve on levels of public investment. Both public investment across the board, we're below the G7 and the OECD average, and specifically on net zero investment. So we do need both. Thank you very much. I've come up badly against time, but can I thank you all? You've made some excellent points uh, today, and we've got the muddle thinking point. We've got a lot of points as well from Rachel. And well done, Helena, uh, for standing in for your colleague. It's such Indeed. short notice, and we wish uh, Libby well. But thank you, and thank all three of you. Order, order. Thank you.
acting has ended. The proceeding 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 has ended.